when Jesus was on the cross, he did not say, I love you this much. He did not say, I love you this much. He said, I love you this much. And extended his arms on the cross and showed how much he loves us to the greatest degree that he could show in an external way. And when he was on that cross, he gave us a powerful weapon. A powerful weapon to fight the good fight in this life against the devil and temptations. He gave us a spiritual vehicle, if you will, so that we may safely journey on this path towards the kingdom of heaven. And what is this gift that I'm speaking of? At the foot of the cross was St. John the Apostle and also the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God. And Jesus said to St. John the Apostle, Behold your mother. And at that hour, St. John the Apostle took the Blessed Virgin Mary into his home and took care of her. My brothers and sisters, St. John the Apostle represented us. We are called to take the mother of God into the hearts of our homes right here and in our lives. Today we celebrate a votive mass of the Blessed Virgin Mary on Saturday. Saturday is tradi traditionally known as the day to honor the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so it is vitally important for us to have a good understanding of who this person is so that she may help us set the world on fire. As I mentioned, the Blessed Mother is our mother, but she's also a queen. It's important for us to address her as a queen. Why? Because the queen always has a lot of pull with the king. The king always looks favorably upon the request of a queen. And so how do we know that the Blessed Virgin Mary is a queen? Well, all we need to do is look at the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there are many accounts in which the queens of kingdoms were not the wife of the king, but rather the mother of the king. We see this, for example, in the account of King Solomon. The queen of the kingdom of Solomon was not his wife. It was his mother, Queen Bathsheba. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven reflects the reality of the Old Testament. And we see the intercession of the queen in the gospel. Jesus went to this wedding feast with his disciples and his dear mother. And during this wedding banquet, the newlyweds ran out of wine. And the Blessed Virgin Mary, the queen, goes to the king, her son Jesus, and says, son, they ran out of wine. She was asking him to perform a miracle. And Jesus responded, Woman, now was not my hour. Now was not my hour to self-manifest my divinity. And what did the Blessed Virgin Mary the Queen do? She just ignored whatever he said. She went over to the servants and she said, do whatever he tells you. She was very assertive. And the Son of God submitted himself to the request of his earthly mother. And he changed water into wine. And all the wedding guests were satisfied. We recall that everything that happens in sacred scripture is arranged by God's divine providence. God knew through all eternity that the Son of God would humbly submit himself to the request of an earthly mother. This speaks volumes. Allow me to introduce to you a few Greek terms to help us better understand the specialness of this woman, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And these three Greek terms has everything to do with adoration, worship, praise, and intercession that we seek to those in the kingdom of heaven. The first Greek term, which is the highest of all of the three, is a Greek term called latria. What latria refers to it's the adoration and worship that we give to God alone as creator. So, for example, whenever we walk into a Catholic church, we orient our body towards the direction of the tabernacle where Jesus Christ, God himself, resides, and we make a genuflection. 
This is an act of worship and adoration. This is the level of Latria. We would not do such a thing to a statue of St. Padre Pio or St. Anthony de Padua. No, because they are creatures. So Latria is the highest level. I'm going to skip a level, and on the bottom level is called Dulia. And what Dulia refers to, it's the intercession and prayers that we offer up and seek to the saints in the kingdom of heaven. So, for example, I mentioned some saints. St. Padre Pio, St. Anthony de Padua, St. John Bosco, St. Therese of Lisieux. We know that they lived heroic virtue in this life, and we know that they're with God, and we seek their intercession to pray for us. As it says in the letter of St. James, prayer from a holy and righteous person is powerful indeed. Now, there is a level in between Latria and Dulia, which is called hyperdulia. Now, let's dissect that word. The second part is called dulia. So we know that on this level, there's still a degree of intercession. But what's the first part? Hyper. Just think of that term, hyper. We could think of a child on a sugar rush or something. They're bouncing off of the walls. They're very active. Well, the term hyperdulia only refers to the Blessed Virgin Mary herself. Why? Because with the Blessed Mother, the Queen, there is a degree of intercession, but her intercession is actually more active than any of the other saints in heaven. Why? Because, again, she's closest to Jesus. She is the Queen. In fact, St. Bernard, who was one of the greatest devotees of the Blessed Virgin Mary, once said that one prayer from the Blessed Virgin Mary is more powerful than all of the prayers of the saints put together. Wow. No, he wasn't defining a doctrine. However, he's a saint. He was devoted to the Blessed Mother, and I think we should take heed to his words of wisdom. So how do we know that Mary is worthy of this level of hyperdulia? Well, we know this because of the four marrying doctrines that we believe as Catholics. These four, and not that they have to necessarily be in this order, first and foremost is... Mary's Immaculate Conception. She was preserved from original sin that was passed on from the sin of Adam. And she never committed any personal sin in her life. Completely pure. Free from any taint of darkness or sin. Secondly, she was assumed into heaven at the completion of her earthly life. She did not decay into the ground. God, in a sense, snatched her into heaven. Thirdly, Mary is the mother of God. As Jesus is God himself, and as Mary is the mother of Jesus, she has the title Mother of God. And last but not least, Mary was a perpetual virgin. She did not have any relations before, during, nor after the birth of Jesus. This shows her special consecration to God, completely set apart for God alone. Now, I just want to emphasize the first two within this homily. Mary's Immaculate Conception. You see, God is all-powerful. He's completely perfect. It would be contrary to God's nature of being completely perfect to create a vessel, an instrument that would be dirty. Because he knew that the Son of God would have to pass through this vessel. It would be beneath him to create a vessel tainted with sin. If you were God yourself, you would create your own mother perfect. And so this is how it worked. God, who works beyond time, who is not limited to time, took the merits of Christ's redeeming blood on the cross, and he applied it at a different moment in time. Specifically, at the moment of Mary's conception in her mother, St. Anne's womb. God, in a sense, extended his hand out and prevented and preserved Mary from falling, from falling into any degree of sin. So, she, yes, she still needs a Savior, but her redemption is applied to her in a different manner than anybody else's. Mary was also assumed into heaven. Again, body and soul at the completion of her earthly life. And how do we know about these two Marian doctrines through the reading of sacred scripture? We know this through reading the Old Testament 
through prefigurements and typologies. You recall I spoke about this last night. There are certain happenings and events and things that took place in the Old Testament that serve as a recognizing in advance of something to be fulfilled in the New Testament. And so we look in the book of Exodus. God ordered Moses to construct what was called the Ark of the Covenant. What the Ark of the Covenant was, was this box-like figure. And it represented the very presence of God. It was sacred. And God gave Moses very special instructions on how that Ark of the Covenant was to be constructed. Just to name a few, they were as follows. That that Ark of the Covenant was to be made of acacia wood. What acacia wood was, it was a special type of wood that did not decay. They had to carry that Ark of the Covenant in the heat of the sun in the desert. So the material had to be very durable. God also ordered that that Ark of the Covenant was to be covered with pure gold. God also ordered that on top of this Ark was to be two cherubim angel statues with their wings spread out overshadowing the ark. And last but not least, what was contained in the ark were three things. The two tablets of the Ten Commandments that Moses received on Mount Sinai, the law of God. Secondly, the staff of Aaron. It was the miracle worker. For example, the staff of Aaron was what split the Red Sea in two so that the Israelite people can walk on dry land towards the promised land. And thirdly, the manna the bread from heaven, which is what the Israelites fed off of as, again, they journeyed towards the promised land. And so we see all of these images of the old Ark of the Covenant and the Old Testament, and we fast forward to the New Testament, we see a correlation with the old to the new. What happens with the Blessed Virgin Mary in regards to relation to the old Ark of the Covenant? Instead of the old Ark of the Covenant being covered with pure gold, Mary is covered with pure flesh, pure soul, no taint of sin whatsoever. Instead of the angels, statues on top of the Ark of the Covenant overshadowing the old Ark of the Covenant, what do we have in the New Testament? The angel Gabriel appears to Mary and he says to her that she will conceive the Son of God in her womb. And she says, how can this be since I do not know man? And the angel says to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Instead of the old Ark of the Covenant that was made of acacia wood that did not decay, what do we have in the New Testament? The Blessed Virgin Mary did not decay. Her body did not go into the ground. God snatched her in a sense and brought her directly into the kingdom of heaven. So we can't make this up, my brothers and sisters. It is clear that Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant. In fact, in the old Ark of the Covenant, if someone touched the Ark of the Covenant, they were struck dead. That's how holy it was. Just imagine just how holy and sacred, if you will, is the body and person of the Blessed Virgin Mary. In other words, don't mess with Mary. And as we see that Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant and that she's covered with pure flesh, she sets a prime example and model for us to be pure in body, to be chaste, in body. I want to show you a powerful image of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Medium man, can you have that poster up? She's up there already. We see in this picture that in the womb area of the body of Mary, there is a chalice. Chalice just like we use at Holy Mass. And inside that chalice is Jesus, which represents the Holy Eucharist. This picture shows us that Mary, because Jesus was in Mary's womb, that she, in a sense, is a living chalice. Just as our Lord Jesus Christ in the Eucharist is in the chalice at Mass, so Jesus 
was in the womb of Mary. Now, Mary's case was very much more profound. Why? Because Jesus was actually attached to the body of Mary. There was an actual transfer of nutrients and oxygen from Mary to Jesus. Mary could actually feel the baby Jesus kick in her womb. That's much more profound. However, she can still be looked at as a living chalice. Well, my brothers and sisters, we receive Holy Communion. We receive the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. Therefore, when we receive communion, we too, in a spiritual sense, are living chalices. So let's take a brief moment to examine the nature and dignity of a chalice. This here is my personal chalice. When I got ordained, somebody gave this to me as a gift. And at my Mass of Thanksgiving, which is typically the first Mass that a newly ordained priest offers, I said a prayer over this chalice. At that moment, this became officially a sacred vessel. It became consecrated, set apart from any other cup that exists. Never call this a cup. If you call this a cup, I'm going to knock you out. My brothers and sisters, we can't just bust out a chalice when we're watching a movie and start drinking Pepsi out of it. No, that would be a misuse and abuse of something sacred, holy. Again, my brothers and sisters, this chalice just represents our body. When God created Adam and Eve, he looked at everything and he said, now it is very good. Not just good when he created all of the other things in the world. He said, now it is very good after he created Adam and Eve in the flesh and the body. Meaning that they're set apart from any other created thing in the world. Therefore, it would be contrary to the dignity of our body to use our body for things such as smoking weed or doing drugs or abusing alcohol or dressing immodestly or using our body for sexual impurity, whatever form it may be. So let's use this example of the chalice, which is right there at the womb of Mary. One of the most powerful ways that we could turn to the Blessed Virgin Mary to help us preserve the great virtue of chastity. And not only just for chastity, but to turn to her to help protect us from all evil, especially the snares of the devil. is through the devotion of the Holy Rosary. My brothers and sisters, this rosary, which has 50 beads, is a spiritual assault weapon. And we have 50 rounds to shoot at the devil. That's a lot of rounds. I think he's going to be shot at some point. The Blessed Mother at Fatima asked us to pray the rosary every day. Now, it's not a precept of the church. However, we should take heed to her request. Just think about it. Maybe there's a soldier out in the Middle East. And he's in harm's way every single day. I think it would be foolish for him if he did not carry a weapon on him every single day. Well, my brothers and sisters, we are in a spiritual war. Just turn on the TV. Drive down the street. Look at the billboards. The devil is attacking us in so many different directions. And we have a powerful weapon to combat it. Let's take advantage of this great devotion. Now, maybe we need to take baby steps, maybe pray a decade or two every day, and hopefully through time we could build up to that full rosary. So let's just break down the Hail Mary real quick so that we understand what it is that we are praying when we say that Hail Mary. When we pray the Hail Mary, we are practically praying the sacred scriptures verbatim. When the angel Gabriel went to Mary, he said, hail, full of grace. Now think of that first term, hail. When we address people every day in our daily life, we don't use that term. We say hi or hello. We don't say hail because that is reserved to address people of nobility. For example, hail Caesar. Well, a glorified angel sent by God 
is saying hail to a creature, we know that the person before us is somebody of high nobility. Then he says, full of grace, meaning there is no room for anything else, no room for any sin or taint of darkness. Then when Mary goes to her relative Elizabeth, Elizabeth says to her, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, whom we know is Jesus. And the second part of the Hail Mary is based on sacred scripture. We say, Holy Mary, we know she's holy because she is hyperdulia and the queen. Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the, and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but at the hour of my death, when I'm about to be judged by Almighty God, Lord, have mercy on my soul. If I'm going to choose one person to be praying for me, I'm going to choose nobody else but the Blessed Virgin Mary. Why? Because, again, she's closest to her son. Can you imagine how much the Blessed Virgin Mary will be praying for us at the hour of our death if we stay faithful to the rosary and praying to Hail Mary? So I'm just going to quote some saints and some holy people here that try and inspire us and provoke us to be faithful to praying the rosary. St. Louis de Montfort once said this. If you say the rosary faithfully until death, I do assure you that in spite of the gravity of your sins, you shall receive a never-fading crown of glory. Even if you are on the brink of damnation, even if you have one foot in hell, even if you have sold your soul to the devil as sorcerers do who practice black magic, and even if you are a heretic as obstinate as a devil, sooner or later, you will be converted and will amend your life and save your soul. If, and mark well what I say, if you say the rosary devoutly every day, until death for the purpose of knowing the truth and obtaining contrition and pardon for your sins. Sister Lucia, who was one of the three children who received the apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary at Fatima, she once said, there is no problem, I tell you, no matter how difficult it is, that we cannot solve by the prayer of the Holy Rosary. And last but not least, St. Pope Pius IX once said, Give me an army saying the rosary, and I will conquer the world. And I'd just like to follow that quote by saying, Turn to the Blessed Mother, and she will help you and I set the world on 